Okay, uh, welcome to uh, Double E Colloquium Speech. It's my greatest honor today to introduce our invited speaker, Dr. Sanjeev Nanda from uh, Qualcomm. Uh, Sanjeev is the Vice President of Engineering in Qualcomm Research. He got his bachelor degree from uh, IIT the best school in India. After that, he got his uh, master and PhD degree uh, from Polytech, uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, uh, followed by ten, more than 10 years of the, uh, work uh, in the at and Bell Lab, and also the, uh, the RADA networks. He joined Qualcomm, uh, and he has been, uh, in the past 20 years, he has been making a lot of contribution, especially in those uh, uh, mobile and cellular contribution in 3G network, in uh, 3G and those 3G Phantom and 3G and Wi-Fi integration, um, as well as AO2.11. He's right now leading a big project called the Contest Well Project in Qualcomm Research. And he got also the IGBOI Vehicular Transportation uh, uh, Society's uh, Best Paper Award. And also uh, he's an IGBOI Fellow. Let's welcome uh, Sanjo. Thank you, Professor Huang. Um, it's my pleasure to be here this morning, uh, talking to everyone here. I notice uh, a nice uh, gap in the middle so that people sit at the edges of uh, the rows so they can escape. I'll try to keep it interesting that you don't, have, don't feel like you need to escape. Thanks. Can, can. Somebody left the glass. Um, so I'm going to uh, take this time. Um, thank you for, uh, for taking the time this morning to come listen to me. Uh, I'll try to uh, give you um, as much information I can as I can about, uh, about Qualcomm and Qualcomm research and what we do. Uh, I know some of you know um, Qualcomm well and some of you not at all. So I'll uh, try my best to give, uh, g give you uh, an insight into uh, what kind of work we do, uh, what, what Qualcomm research is about, uh, and what Qualcomm is. Um, and uh, I, I chose uh, two topics here, um, I call intelligent devices and small cells. They cover sort of two, two different parts of, uh, of something that I've been working on over the last five years. Um, so let's start with, so Qualcomm's uh, uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of firsts and bests and so on. Most importantly, I think uh, we're the largest fabulous uh, semiconductor company, and we're number one in wireless. And uh, it's it's really a um, really an exciting time to be in in this industry. I've been uh, working uh, in wireless and cellular for the last uh, twenty or more years, and um, it's amazing uh, amazing the kinds of where we've come. Um, here's some some really really large numbers, uh, you know. 3G connections uh, approaching 2 billion, wireless connections uh, exceeding 6 billion. And sometimes we, you know, these days we, uh, billions and trillions uh, stop meaning, uh, stop uh, meaning, uh, have started meaning less to us. Uh, there's lots of big numbers that we hear in the news and so on. But 6 billion uh, people, 6 billion wireless connections is a really large number uh, when you realize that the world population is 7 billion. Um, and uh, another number, another large number, uh, which, is, uh, which is the number of Facebook users. And so uh, when you think of uh, Qualcomm, think of uh, being the largest supplier of, uh, of uh, chipset technology uh, for, these, uh, for this ubiquitous available mobile uh, cell phones and, and smartphones that are, that are available today. And, um, and so, so in, in some, some of you who've known us uh, over the years know us as, as the uh, kind of uh, leading supplier of, of uh, or leading uh, company in 
uh, what was initially called 1X and DO and CDMA uh, 2000, and then it became uh, the next kind of uh, large step was WCDMA. Uh, um, and so you, you may think of us as a CDMA company, and I'm here to tell you uh, that we're currently the largest supplier of, uh, uh, of LTE chipsets as well, uh, 4G LTE. Um, and uh, my cell phone and the cell phone that uh, uh, my colleague Doug is carrying over here, uh, they're both uh, they're the AT&T and, and Verizon, uh, and they uh, both have good 4G LTE coverage here. Um, mine didn't work as well in, the, in, this, uh, in this auditorium. Uh, his worked well. We'll talk about that in a, in a second. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so we're the, uh, you know, we're already, uh, even though it's LTE is just deployed uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we're already on our third generation of, of uh, LTE chipsets. So, uh, and then um, what we do is uh, we invest uh, significant amounts of uh, our, our, uh, our revenues into, into R&D. Um, and this shows uh, in, the, in the range of 20%, um, <coughs> and uh, you know, steadily increasing as our revenues increase. And we, our, our, uh, our research uh, uh, locations are in 10, 10 uh, locations around the world. Um, there's four in uh, North America, and uh, six around the world, three in Europe, three in Asia, and uh, uh, what else? So, and what we work on is uh, a variety of uh, uh, di dimensions uh, that, that basically address the cell phone or the smartphone industry today and beyond. Uh, so you can see the, there's the standard, the, the basic uh, 3G, 4G, which is our core uh, bread and butter, which we uh, have a variety of uh, projects in. And then we keep uh, moving beyond that to local area networks and, and, and wired uh, networks. Our, 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 Acquisition a couple of years ago of, of uh, Qualcomm of Atheros uh, gave us a, a big leg up in uh, in, wi in uh, wi wireless LAN technology as well as in core in Ethernet and uh, um, high speed Ethernet and so on. Then we work on a lot of uh, uh, technologies that we kind of put under the, under the umbrella of uh, application enablers, which includes um, uh, things like uh, multimedia and, uh, and uh, augmented reality and uh, the co contextual awareness project that I lead. Uh, and then, of course, we need to uh, continue to make uh, 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 progress in uh, low power uh, implementation and high performance implementation on both, both, uh, on both dimensions uh, for, uh, for implementing in our chipsets. So I'm going to take, um, so that's kind of, uh, quick background on, on who we are. And what I'm going to do is I have an um, initial portion of my talk focus on a few, uh, few items on the left side of the screen, which is, um, uh, which is uh, a few things about our 3G and 4G technologies. Some, some, some actually some try to give you some uh, feel for the types of uh, innovations that have occurred in the last few years. And then, uh, kind of switch gears, talk to you a little bit more about uh, what, what goes into our smartphones and, uh, and, and finish up with, uh, uh, with uh, some uh, a view of what we're doing on, on uh, my uh, project uh, AWARE, the AWARE project, project on context awareness. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, so here's something that, uh, you know, uh, Qualcomm uh, uh, 20 or more years ago, uh, more than 20 years ago, we, uh, Qualcomm uh, decided that they were going to change uh, the way uh, cellular worked. And uh, I, I recall that we said, uh, or Qualcomm said that there was a 20x uh, or 20 times improvement in voice call capacity that was available, a big number. And so, um, uh, so that was pretty challenging and, and successful and so on and so forth. Uh, I want to show you that uh, about five years or three years ago, or three or four years ago, Somebody showed up uh, in in our uh, in research in, and said, "Well, you know, you 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 did 10x. I think there's at least 3x more uh, of uh, voice capacity and available with with uh, with newer uh, with newer ways of uh, of uh, signal processing and so on." And so this is a is an example. Um, it's it's fairly interesting. Uh, so I want to take a minute about, on on this. And so um, what you want to do for voice is you don't want to increase um, the, the latency, 
And uh, you, um, you, you, meanwhile, for data over the last several years, we've been doing hybrid ARQ, where you basically uh, operate close to capacity by just doing incremental redundancy transmission, or you just get a su subsequent, you just operate right at the, uh, right close to uh, the, the capacity of the channel. And so uh, the realization here was very interesting because voice, uh, there's, uh, you can do, uh, what you do is you do multi-user uh, multi detection, basically. So you get all the voice, uh, 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 you, you have multi-user detection at the base station, for example. Uh, and uh, what you would do is you would have, you would do what is called, uh, we're calling it virtual hi hybrid ARQ or frame early termination. So as soon as a particular uh, channel is decoded, you, you can use that, uh, you can use that uh, decoded channel to uh, do interference cancellation on the, on the other, uh, on the other voice, voice channel. And so, uh, so basically, uh, you, uh, as, as the frame progresses, the signal to noise ratio um, is, is, is improving for the, for the subsequent decodings. Okay. So, uh, so it turned out that we, this, this particular uh, project ended up with a, with a f uh, 4x improvement in, uh, in voice capacity. We were getting over 100 and, uh, I don't know, I think over 105 voice calls in a one and a quarter uh, megahertz channel. And um, so, so it, it, the, there's a set of, uh, uh, set of uh, things listed here that, that in combination achieved this great, uh, great uh, enhancement in voice call capacity. So there's this frame early termination, but then what you do is you do, you don't really need to do very fast power control because the, the, the differences in, uh, in received uh, receive power provide you this difference in signal to noise ratio over the frame where where which allows better multi user you know b better cancellation in the later part of the frame and so on and so and then we had a better vocoder as a part of the part of the deal and then there's some other things listed on how you know how the same thing works on the reverse link so this was pretty uh, pretty exciting because here you know people thought that voice capacity uh, on cellular had reached some limit and we we, we found there was uh, there's much more left uh, on the table. Um, so now uh, moving on. Uh, so data, of course, is 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 key. As as all of us know, we're using it uh, regularly in our smartphones. And uh, here's another kind of uh, interesting uh, innovation. We it's called we refer to it as uh, range expansion in heterogeneous networks. And uh, here, for example, what we're showing is uh, there's there's uh, there's a macro cell, and there are two two uh, carriers on the macro cell. Uh, one, one, let's call it the primary carrier and the, let's call it the secondary carrier. And so what you do is you, uh, you, know, you drop a Pico cell. So this is obvious, you do more reuse, you get, uh, you get uh, more uh, throughput over in, in the area. So for example, if you put four Pico cells in each macro cell area, you get some uh, 1.6x uh, improvement in the median, median uh, data rate that's, that, that the user is seeing. But more interesting uh, is, the, is, this, is the case where what you do is, uh, the, the, the limitation turns out to be that uh, the Pico cell in this case, because the macro cell uh, power is stronger, the Pico cell coverage area is much reduced. And so what you can do is, uh, on, on the secondary carrier, uh, you can uh, decrease the power on the macro cell, decrease the transmit power on the macro cell. So it shrinks the macro cell coverage and increases the Pico cell coverage uh, on the secondary carrier, and overall, as a result, you get in improvement in the median uh, data rate available uh, to, to users at the edge of the Pico cell and, and uh, at the boundaries between Pico and macro and so on. So that's, uh, so uh, the, the reduced ma uh, macro cell power, you get this range expansion which overall increases the median, median data rate available. And then uh, more, more, more interestingly, what you can do is you can actually, uh, for any user, you can have, uh, we, we, we have this capability uh, currently in, in our chipsets. Basically, you can, um, you can connect to multiple cells. So you can get the best data rate available on the primary uh, carrier and the best data rate available on the secondary carrier. So there's, so there's more than the 3.1x uh, median throughput uh, increase available. So that's a sec kind of a second example. You know, it looks like, uh, the, 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 these are kind of what I would what I would consider uh, an, um, examples of how we uh, are 
kind of systems engineering team is, uh, is pushing uh, kind of innovative ideas to get this uh, user experience improvements. Um, so the other uh, uh, kind of uh, important or uh, what, what should I say, a critical piece of the way we do our, 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 tech, our research and our uh, technology innovation and development is uh, through basically through a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, over the air test beds and, and, and lab work and so on. So in the LTE advanced, uh, we're doing a variety of things, uh, interference management with, with these heterogeneous networks, the range expansion that we talked about, um, you, you choose the best uh, base station to connect to to get the maximum throughput. Uh, and then you do all kinds of uh, advanced receive, uh, interference cancellation, you know, canceling uh, pilot channels, overhead channels, um, even uh, other data channels, and so on and so forth. So a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, we're, we're for example, uh, a lot of uh, uh, requirements uh, in the receiver design have to, have to do with, uh, with receiving uh, receiving data channels uh, where the pilot uh, uh, carrier to interference ratio is negative, like minus 10 dB or minus 15 dB and so on and so forth. So you're really operating in regions where your, uh, where your um, desired signal is, is below the interfering signal. So um, here's a list of the uh, variety of things in, uh, in the next generation LTE work uh, that we're doing. We have uh, what we call plug and play relays. You just go set up somewhere and uh, it connects to the macro cell and, and, uh, and transmits uh, and, and allows uh, uh, mobiles to connect uh, and picos, femtos, and so on and so forth. Um, what I want to, uh, so there's a lot of uh, other interesting uh, ideas mentioned here that, that we're pursuing. Um, but I want to switch to the next uh, topic, uh, which is which is what, uh, what, what we're uh, really excited about as we pursue this vision that uh, somehow in the next uh, half a dozen or more years, uh, we're going to, uh, continue, to uh, continue to have data, or data throughput requirements, wireless data throughput requirements driven by uh, video, um, streaming video and so on and so forth. Uh, where we really need to uh, keep our ramp uh, going steadily up uh, and, and you know, delivering perhaps 1,000x uh, data throughput over wireless. And that's kind of a, a goal we've set ourselves. So what we discovered is uh, you know, we've been uh, looking at femtocells for a while. Femtocells are what indoor base stations, sort of like your wireless access points, uh, Wi-Fi access points. And um, this is one kind of uh, little uh, picture shown on the left. And so we went to a particular neighborhood uh, somewhere in um, uh, somewhere east of San Diego, and um, just drove around uh, looking at uh, what uh, signals were available outside. Actually, we did uh, what we do. What we did is we measured some signals from the femtocells uh, that were deployed already by people, meaning people just bought them and, and installed them. And there was in this neighborhood, there's like a few hundred homes. There was a seven percent uh, penetration of femtocells. In, in this neighborhood, and we just measured the signals, and then we came back and uh, we um, we created uh, models of of this neighborhood, and started uh, playing with the adjusting transmit powers uh, of these of these femtocells, and tried to see uh, what kind of coverage, outdoor coverage on streets, can you get from indoor femtocells, and uh, we discovered that basically that neighborhood with seven percent uh, penetration, that neighborhood pretty much had uh, had uh, uh, coverage throughout the throughout the you know throughout the neighborhood outside there was coverage, but then we adjusted the power up to about uh, 13 dBm, uh, uh, 20 milliwatts, and so <clears throat> so that was kind of an interesting uh, interesting discovery because that could be a network deployment model um, uh, for the future, where basically you just let uh, let uh, people deploy these things, or, or uh, the cable company, or someone deploy these things, and you provide coverage uh, throughout. And, and the capacities are, are, are astounding because now you're really getting densification, which you don't get by, you know, finding towers and backhaul and picocells and so on and so forth. So, 
Um, <coughs> so we, we've done some uh, other studies in some other neighborhoods and so on and so forth. And somehow you can get 96% uh, of the traffic uh, offloaded from macro cells if you have 20% of homes uh, that, have, uh, that have femtocells with what we're calling neighborhood femtocells, neighborhood uh, uh, providing coverage both indoor and outdoors from outside from inside. So, um, so that's kind of uh, a, 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 a direction that we want to continue to sort of pursue and uh, understand how, how we can actually make this practical. So that's a very uh, interesting uh, project that we have. Um, so the idea is that what we're calling ultra SON. Uh, SON there stands for self-organizing network. And um, basically, you know, you, uh, in, any, um, in any morphology, in any deployment uh, scenario, you just have indoor uh, femtocells complementing the macro cells that are deployed outside. And at, as soon as you deploy the femtocell, it starts doing some sensing and it tries to figure out what transmit power uh, to use. Uh, it selects its, uh, its, uh, its codes uh, that it used to uh, transmit, uh, channels and codes. And then, uh, and then it starts optimizing its uh, handoff parameters and, uh, and, and how, la how, la how large to uh, do the, uh, how many cells to do paging over and, 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 optimize, and, and uh, optimize handoffs. And then, as as once the once you once the system is is running, um, then you continue to adapt as as more femtocells get deployed, and so you continue to adjust transmit powers. One of the critical issues with the, this kind of a self-organizing um, network would be uh, the creation of what, are, what what we used to call years ago um, pilot pollution. Basically. Too many signals creating a signal to noise ratio that is bad uh, in, in many regions. So what you have to do is you have to adjust powers of the uh, various femtocells so that the uh, so that pilot pollution is avoided. So this is, uh, as I said, it's a very key uh, large uh, project that we that we're pursuing right now um, in in, uh, in Qualcomm Research. And so uh, we have uh, we have currently have a seven cell. Uh, system uh, uh, in, in, on our campus, seven small cells. You can see here, uh, they're kind of little. Some are near windows, some are not. Some are far away. This basically wherever people would put them. And uh, this particular um, uh, schematic that's shown is derived from, we use a tool called WinProp, which uh, you may have seen. It's kind of a, a prop, ray, ray trace kind of propagation tool. And so this is kind of coverage maps created uh, using WinProp. Um, and our goal by the end of this year is to have a 50-cell um, 50 50 cell network on campus, a 50 femtocell network on campus. And basically, uh, totally unplanned, our goal is to kind of uh, be able to carry a femtocell and plug it into any wall, connect Ethernet, and uh, let, it, let those things self-adjust, and so on and so forth. So that's, um, so that's kind of uh, a direction that we, uh, we're pursuing. All right, so I talked fast. I hope uh, you could follow along. Um, so I think I want to, uh, this is a time when I was, so this was my kind of uh, uh, information uh, for you uh, on uh, what we're doing in 3G and uh, 4G technologies. Um, and uh, so I think the, the key things um, uh, are we're doing, uh, advanced receivers, uh, interference cancellation, uh, interference management, um, and uh, interference, they call it, in fact, uh, there's a nice uh, uh, acronym that we've been using, IC, 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 I forget, I think it's called, we call it Ice Cube. Uh, interference cancellation, interference coordination, and interference, I forget. Um, anyway, so, so that's, uh, those, are, uh, those are the uh, research programs in, in, in that dimension. Um, that that just shows. Uh, in fact, more, more, quite interestingly, um, you know, uh, the 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 small cell, the base station that you normally think of, which is shown on the right, uh, the small cells uh, are likely to be uh, smaller than than uh, than your smartphone. Uh, they have they don't need a screen the size of our the, the current sm smartphones and so on and so forth. And probably more, probably less expensive than, than smartphones. So that's pretty interesting as well. 
And uh, so yeah, to you know, summarize basically huge capacity gains, uh, low cost deployment, and easy to deploy. So that's kind of our, uh, our thousand X story uh, from Qualcomm. Um, so what I was planning to do next was uh, something that, uh, like a, li a little bit of a um, uh, demo uh, which, uh, which didn't work uh, because uh, I was trying to show you that uh, I have a cell phone here which has a really large screen. It's an HTC uh, device. And it has, um, it has uh, LTE 4G. Uh, we can, I, when I was sitting in my uh, condo in, in, in San Diego, we were, I was getting about, uh, I think, seven megabits uh, downlink uh, speeds. And, uh, and it also has a HD, HDMI video playout. And uh, you can, uh, I, I have actually watched, uh, watched movies over the internet using LTE, um, sitting, uh, connecting it to my TV, uh, streaming from this device. And so, um, so that was uh, fairly interesting. And I think we were able to uh, get the video streaming here uh, in my, on my colleague's phone. And then when we, can, we had three connectors between here. So you go from this USB here uh, to, uh, to, a, to HDMI using this MHL kind of, uh, these things are out these days. So you can go USB to HDMI. And then we didn't have a HDMI to, to display here. So then uh, Professor Huang got me a HDMI to VGA <laughs> thing. And so we, when we connected it all, um, we saw, uh, what, what did we see? We saw that you would get about a half a second of video, and then it would blank out, and then we get a half a second of video. So instead of showing you that, I just promise you that that's possible. You can, you can see it on uh, Doug's phone later. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll show you the video I was going to show you anyway, because it kind of allows me to connect back to uh, the other piece of the talk that I wanted to give. So let's see if, uh, let's see if we can pull this off. And I don't know if the sound is there. Can we get sound? No? Maybe not. No? A dragon is coming. Devour you, beast! Stay together! Let me live! No, a slightly small... All right, we can give up. Try one more time. Can we get sound? I guess not. All right. So, um, well, we'll just talk. We'll skip this. A dragon is coming. Uh huh. Thank you. This summer, a dragon is coming. Come on, you beast! Stay together, and we live! No, a slightly smaller dragon. Tiny, really. But faster. Way faster. And cuter, but not that cute. A dragon that's smarter. More advanced. Can multitask, and doesn't waste power. This summer, a dragon is coming. Not to a theater, not to an enchanted little village. Nope, this dragon is coming to your phone. Well, technically, in your phone. Make sure your next phone has the blockbuster speed and performance hundreds of millions already love. Make sure it has a Snapdragon processor. All right, thanks. I was, the uh, purpose is to tell you uh, that that aside from the you know aside from the 4G LTE stuff that that uh, is pretty pretty exciting, the uh, the, the the modem itself uh, in our devices is a is a really uh, tiny part of the of the of the overall device itself, and this shows you the the modem is listed there and it has a lot of uh, interesting uh, letters and gobbledygook which uh, some of you know the meaning of and some of you don't. 
but, uh, but look at all the other uh, stuff. We have, in this phone, uh, which, which does have uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon inside, um, there's a 10, the, we, we have 1080p video playout and recording, uh, 20 megapixel camera, um, of course GPS, 480 megabits per second USB out, uh, and then notice the, uh, what's it called, CAT3 uh, LTE, which is 100, 100 megabit modem uh, on receive. And of course, 11N with, uh, uh, and 11AC coming soon. So just, uh, you know, gives you a, a feel for what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of technologies Qualcomm is producing uh, aside from, uh, you know, what you think of as 3G and 4G. So I want to uh, take a few minutes from here to just talk about uh, some, some more uh, details about, you know, this is kind of the basic chip. So uh, it's available uh, as a uh, mobile development platform. Um, uh, for example, there are, uh, there are in, 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 uh, in smartphone and uh, tablet formats, but it's also available as what, what is called Dragon Board. I was discussing it with Professor Chizik this uh, a little bit, a little while ago. Um, <coughs> which is kind of a exploded uh, open uh, look at the same platform. And uh, it's available, uh, I think there's ways to uh, uh, apply for grants to get it and so on and so forth, and we can discuss that. So, so that's kind of the kind of dragon board. Um, and there's a, there's a support site and so on where you can, where you can, uh, where you can discuss issues and uh, get, some, get some issues resolved. Um, the, the next thing I want to talk about was uh, something we call QDevNet. It's a series of, uh, series of uh, software, uh, the series of SDKs uh, and APIs available uh, that, that, one can, that one can use. And I'm just going to list a number of these. Uh, there's the augmented reality uh, SDK. It's called Vuforia. And uh, if you have uh, more to discuss on, on, on our you know, vision-based augmented reality SDK, uh, Doug would have uh, a lot of uh, information on that. He's been working for a few years on that. Um, related to the augmented reality uh, SDK is our fast CV. Um, it's a computer vision uh, accelerated through some low-level uh, hardware enhancements. So you can uh, you can get the fast CV SDK uh, to run on these on the Dragon Board or or our, or our uh, chipset platforms, uh, tablet and uh, and smartphone platforms. There's a context-aware SDK uh, known as Gimbal, and in that we have some geofencing capability and some other. And uh, my project, uh, Context Awareness, is uh, focused on uh, uh, adding more and more uh, APIs to the context-aware uh, SDK. Um, there's uh, uh, on, on the on the graphics. There's a uh, gaming and graphics uh, optimization. SDK. Uh, there's mobile multimedia optimization, which allows you to uh, run video uh, faster, video uh, faster through the. And then uh, there's a, another set of uh, SDKs, uh, one to do with location. So we have in that in that we have uh, indoor uh, location as well, in addition to uh, low power uh, geofencing capability. We have an SDK uh, for audio, where you have uh, enhanced echo cancellation, uh, for example, and uh, some other new features coming out pretty soon. Uh, there's a sensors SDK, which, which allows you uh, uh, things like uh, gestures, of sensor-based gestures. Um, and then uh, there's camera SDK with, uh, with eye tracking, uh, as well as uh, yeah, some smile thing. Um, probably a few others. I mean, these, I, 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 I'm not uh, familiar with each one of them, so there are probably other uh, capabilities. And then touch-free, camera-based touch-free gestures as well. And also, actually, uh, ultrasound-based uh, touch-free gestures as well. Um, so, um, so that's kind of a list of the variety of things. And I, um, what you saw is that basically uh, it's the, the smartphone uh, is clearly a lot more than uh, a phone, um, goes without saying. Um, it's uh, really a compact computing d device, uh, really powerful uh, microprocessors, uh, ARM-based uh, microprocessors. It, very, it says ubiquitous connectivity. Ubiquitous is key, and of course, high-speed, uh, very, very high-speed connectivity as well, and uh, all kinds of uh, interactions uh, existing as well as uh, and, you know, new ways of interacting with the device. 
And so the, the key thing for the next part of uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, in, aside from all these capabilities, what, what has happened is uh, because of these capabilities, the smartphone is uh, always with you. And that allows you to, uh, to, uh, to, en to enable this context awareness uh, um, that, that, that's possible on smartphones. And so this just uh, tells you why. Uh, the, most people uh, are checking their emails and Facebook uh, updates uh, before they brush their teeth in the morning. Um, so what you want to do is, <coughs> what you want to do is you want to take all the all the variety of data sources at low level, low level sensing, as well as uh, as well as uh, as well as soft data that is available uh, through app, apps and such, and kind of look for patterns in the data, uh, recognize user situations. And then become the personal assistant that people are uh, looking for by anticipating, predicting, and alerting the user uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a polite, uh, deferent, and uh, privacy-sensitive way. And that's kind of the way uh, the, uh, the artificial intelligence community might look at uh, context awareness. And in addition, uh, from, our, from our perspective, you know, it's, it has to be always on and in the background with very low power. Um, and I think background low power is, a, is, a, is key, and we have a, uh, I have a feeling that that's how we'll uh, make an impact in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this domain, uh, because we can enable this, uh, this capability with, uh, in, a, in a low power background way. And I'm gonna take a few minutes and tell you more about this. So here's a kind of, uh, just a quick, uh, video of a few things that, that we've, uh, that my team has been working on. These are not, I think, they're not necessarily uh, things that you haven't seen before, but we have them now available on our, uh, you know, on our uh, cell phone, uh, on, on, implemented on our platforms. Particularly on audio, we um, we do this uh, privacy-sensitive audio sampling, where basically we do a very very small duty cycle, um, few, let's, uh, something like 20 milliseconds every second. and then um, just uh, getting uh, use in this particular case getting user labeled place place name okay so um, I give you a little bit of idea of how this thing uh, um, what what how, how this thing fits in our in our platform so the approach we're taking is that basically there are these low-level uh, sensing uh, that that comes from the physical sensors and then we have, we're applying uh, both uh, supervised and kind of semi-supervised or unsupervised uh, kind of uh, you know, clustering kinds of methods and so on. So I just put them in two sides. Basically, uh, the motion states and target sounds, we can probably do some, uh, some kinds of uh, supervised learning. And then on, the, uh, uh, on audio environments and uh, places, uh, we're, we're doing uh, clustering. Uh, to, to discover uh, relevance, relevant places or relevant environments for the user. And, um, and the goal is to kind of infer day in the life situations that, that were list, you know, kind of high level situations. And of course that, you know, moving up uh, there to uh, abstract situations require you, requires you to fuse uh, uh, other sources of information as well. So the, the way the kind of uh, framework works is you have, 
you take these data sources and you have these low level uh, uh, inferences based on some either pre-learned models or, 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 uh, or uh, models that are learned on the fly uh, because you feed the context streams back to the, to the learning uh, and, and store them in the knowledge base. And then some higher level uh, uh, common sense rules and so on you can apply to infer day in the life situations like you know if it's if it's uh, if it's uh, i mean if you, to figure out work versus home or uh, whether you're commuting to work and so on and so forth you can apply some common sense uh, common sense uh, rules and so on so that's uh, what the structure of our uh, platform or uh, framework for our uh, uh, day in the life situation uh, inference work is is it consists of and the 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 two uh, critical pieces uh, that that come with uh, the way we are approaching this, or the way the way it becomes uh, uh, our uh, our look or our view of this. The first is uh, how do you architect privacy in this context? And as I mentioned uh, a little while back, um, firstly you uh, do um, you do privacy sensitive uh, data collection itself. So you don't you already, uh, for example, if you can, sorry, if you can directly uh, compute. Uh, uh, features, then you don't have to store raw data, right? And then um, beyond that, uh, you you don't you don't need to you, the data stays on the device and you, it's secured on the device. Our, our devices are are uh, you know uh, we have good security uh, mechanisms built into uh, our our storage. Uh, and then from there on, <coughs> what you do is you uh, want to provide a user with a traceable way of uh, understanding so that the user has explanations and control. And so what we want to do is we, uh, in the data model itself, where we store uh, inferences as well as the uh, sources of how those inferences were derived, uh, the, the provenance is captured in the data model itself. So it, it's like a, um, um, that it, you, you really have to uh, architect privacy in this comprehensive way uh, in, in this, uh, as we go into this uh, territory of uh, doing uh, context inference on, on, the, on the user. And the second part uh, of, uh, of architecting uh, context awareness has to do with low power. And in that, uh, I'm going to uh, show you some sort of a schematic way of how, how we are approaching that. So you have your you know, uh, low level sensing uh, that's going on, um, uh, basically accelerometers and uh, other kinds of audio and so on and so forth. Um, and maybe uh, background uh, location via cellular or some detection of Bluetooth or something, whatever can be handled at very, very low power. And you do your first level of uh, data acquisition and some very low power feature computation or some, uh, some, uh, some detection of some change, uh, change in events in a particular sensor stream and so on and so forth. So you can do that at very, very low power. Uh, I listed here something, I, you know, you really have to operate all this kind of sub milliamp at battery, sub one milliamp at battery, the, this portion of the thing. And then you detect some events, some wake on event that occurs. And what you do is you, uh, you have some kind of a way of then, uh, you know, I, I, I'm showing always on manager, but you, the implementation can, can be different. But basically those wake on events cause other triggers to happen which, uh, which cause other uh, sensing to, to start occurring. So you could have a wake on event uh, that you detect that you started walking, and that would be a good time to turn on uh, uh, turn on uh, Wi-Fi fingerprint uh, scanning, or you detect that you started driving, and uh, that would be a good time to turn on GPS, and so on. So, um, so that's kind of the and so so that those events are infrequent, and there those are those are power consuming. So you can kind of architect it that way. And similarly, uh, in other in other domains, in other uh, situation detection, and then these things all uh, produce high-level uh, uh, inferences, like your location change and so on and so forth, which then uh, creates triggers, which where the software can be on the uh, AP itself, on the app's processor itself, and that can uh, that runs uh, you know less than a hundred times a day or something. And that that we can we can afford uh, in the same very very low power budget. So um, I think I've, I've uh, given you a, f a flavor of uh, how we're uh, architect architecting context uh, on our on our uh, on our platforms. 
and uh, you know what what we think of today as a as what we said a smartphone which is a computing connected kind of device which which allows you to do entertainment and uh, and uh, information gathering uh, I, sus I i expect that it'll be uh, tomorrow it'll be a uh, intelligent personal assistant it it becomes your kind of ui uh, to everything around you um, basically the a user interface to all kinds of sensing uh, all kinds of data collection data gathering um, yeah, maybe a control control of uh, devices and so on and so forth and that's what uh, that's kind of a vision uh, that we're working towards and um, i thank you for your attention Yes. Uh, how is the, um, oh, sorry. I have one here. How is the handoff going from femme to cell to uh, macro? Because uh, that's, I think, been an issue in the past. And the other one, what's the business model of that? So the questions are, um, how does handoff uh, work from femme to uh, cell to macro? And uh, is, uh, is the business model for femme to challenge? Um, so the handoff for the femme to macro uh, continues to be a challenge for the following reason. Uh, the basically, Handoffs are best handled when you have a very, very integrated uh, network where you can. And uh, it turns out that um, the um, that femtos are often deployed by different uh, have different vendors from uh, macro vendors, and the standards are sometimes lacking, or, or, or the standards may not be lacking, but the implementation is. Uh, um, but uh, I think. Uh, it's working better because, at least in some networks, we've, we've seen that it's, it's working better because I think the operators desire to have this. And uh, I think the, 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 the uh, femto to macro is working pretty well at this point. Uh, the macro to femto can be a challenge. And uh, you know, I think uh, perhaps in LTE, it, it, will be, it will work well because I think the uh, desire is there for, from the operators to make the make it work well, and uh, so that's my expectation. And then and the, um, on the business model, um, again, I think it's, it, we, we're seeing this, uh, this, uh, this ramp up in data, and I'm, I, I, you know, I, I really have watched a movie uh, with this and so on. And if I come in here, you know, if, uh, uh, Dr. Sahar was good enough to provide me this Wi-Fi uh, you know, cord here, but my 4G uh, in, the, in the hotel room, so there are reasons why, and, and the data rates are, are getting up there enough, and the video coding is good enough that um, amazingly you can watch a movie in the hotel room uh, with over 4G. So it's we'll see we'll see how the business uh, works out. Questions? So early in the presentation you had an example where you have a small cell with one carrier, yeah. and you would lower the power of one of the carriers so you have a, a small cell operating. How would you do this in, like I said, an automated fashion? Because that seems like a very niche case that you need to know you have a high density of small cells. Right. So the question is, uh, in the in the case of uh, uh, heterogeneous network with uh, range expansion, uh, can you uh, can you make it sort of autonomous, autonomously uh, manage to set its power? And the the, the Pico cell deployments um, that people are doing, where they, they do this range expansion. Operators continue to um, do um, do cellular engineering by doing drive tests and so on and so forth. So, um, I, I I think the there is a desire by the operators to do more. I think they are they are willing to go through the exercise of doing the initial tuning and then do some kind of self-organizing um, kind of automatically in the sense the adapt adaptation by getting reports from uh, mobiles that drop calls and so on and so forth so they you know or data rate reports or where the highest uh, density of use is and so on and so forth so there's some movement towards doing some self organizing uh, based on mobile feedback and that's kind of the approach in 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 particular for our um, femtocell what we're calling ultrason it's where our designs are completely autonomous no no tuning uh, by uh, by you know, no hand tuning at all. And you should come down sometime uh, later in the year and look at what's going on. 
to the question at the back. So I'm curious about the uh, what Qualcomm's work is doing on the indoor location-based services. I've seen a lot of prior work on using Wi-Fi triangulation, but the results have never been quite satisfying. Is Qualcomm doing anything different? No, we're doing uh, both. We're doing uh, triangle. Well, we're doing uh, triangulation. We're, we're doing also uh, RTT-based uh, triangulation. So that we're getting uh, somewhere below five meters accuracy in, in let's say, in malls and office buildings and so on. With how many sensors? With how many access points? A, a good density is. Um, I, I mean, if there are four or five visible, then it's pretty good. We can talk more if, I, I mean, I, there's a lot more detail there, but you know. I'm sorry I didn't repeat the question, but anyway, keep going. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about how some of the uh, self-organizing is done with the company cells, like how they get into the network. And so, the go ahead, say, say, <coughs> complete your. Oh, uh, just acknowledge all the other femtocells around the job. Right. So the question is, how is uh, self-organizing happen in femtocells? And, um, Basically, there's a there's a uh, there's a um, what, what would you call it? a mobile receive kind of function uh, in the femtocell itself, which allows you to measure other base station uh, powers, uh, uh, the um, powers as well as the uh, the code, uh, the the PCI or whatever code they're using, the PSC, um, and uh, so that's one step. That's kind of the initial step where you basically measure the rest of the network, the macro and so on. The uh, operator in their management thing has provided you what is, whether it's, whether it's the same frequency deployment or multi-frequency, and so you can see if you must scan different frequencies, whether you should do it on the macro carrier or a carrier that is not, does not have the macro. Um, so you kind of use those rules. So that's kind of the step one. Then you uh, learn the neighbors, so if you want to do uh, enable handoff to femtos or to the macro. So you can learn what the neighbor macro is or the strongest macro is. And you can report back to, so that you can set up handoff metrics and so on. And then during operation, you have sort of this closed loop uh, uh, method where basically any mobile that passes by or is in call or not uh, can report uh, signal strength uh, kind of relative signal strengths between the macro and the, and the femto. And that allows you to, or, or, or multi multiple femtos, and that allows you to adjust uh, uh, macro femto boundaries. So that's kind of a series of uh, methods. And then there are other issues to do, deal with, deal with the when, uh, you know, if you can get, if, you can, if you're connected to a, a low, um, uh, connected to a macro and transmitting at very high power, and you could desense the uh, desense of femto and so on and so forth. So there are other little tricks that you have to play as well. I assume. The question is, um, when you have this kind of a head net with range expansion, is it possible to uh, coordinate so that you maximize the capacity of both? And absolutely, I think that's pretty. That's exactly the the goal of the goal of the exercise. And what we now have is um, the the mobiles. You know, we we unfortunately we specialize in all kinds of uh, inaccessible. Uh, terminology like what you saw there. And so we have these things called DF, DC, and SF, DC, and whatnot. And basically what, what it means is that, that the mobiles are capable of both uh, dual carrier, so they're on multiple carriers which can be in multiple bands if necessary, and they're cap capable of dual cell, which means uh, they can, in, in fact, in, in UMTS or WCDMA, every carrier is a cell and every you know, cell is a cell, and so it's very confusing, but anyway, what you can do is you can connect to multiple carriers and multiple base stations simultaneously and get uh, maximize uh, your throughput or you know whatever uh, criteria you may want to apply to maximize uh, some fair throughput or something so absolutely that's kind of the goal of all this flexibility uh, before we wrap up the uh, Q&A I'd like to also introduce Catherine 
Uh, she is going to stay here tomorrow for student or information section and also recruiting job. In case you are interested in uh, finding a job in Qualcomm, uh, Catherine, can you talk about tomorrow's U.S. schedule and the location? Sure, yeah, I'll be here all day tomorrow, and then mainly um, in the afternoon from about 1 to 5.30, I'll be in room M301, and then I'll be in room 301. And if you're interested in internships or full-time opportunities, um, I'd be glad to sit down with you and kind of learn about your interests. And I also have uh, my colleague Doug Nicely here. Um, and Doug has worked on uh, a variety of things, including uh, Femtocells in his previous uh, previous life and uh, currently working on augmented reality. Any more question? If not, let's uh, give a big hand uh, to Sanjeev. <laughs>